in this lesson 7 we are gonna solve question number 53 to question number 65 of the CLC mathematics of the year 2012 2013 Ethiopian calendar question number 53 consider the following frequency distribution of grouped data value 95 up to 99 with a frequency 4 90 up to 94 with a frequency 6 85 up to 89 with a frequency 10 80 up to 84 with a frequency 16 75 up to 79 with a frequency 9 70 up to 74 with a frequency 5 The question is, which of the following statement is true about this frequency distribution? The choices are asking about class boundaries and class intervals To reply such question, we have to make sure that the group data is in continuous form But the data is not in continuous form because there is a one unit gap between the lower class limit of a given class and the upper class limit of the next class. Thus, let's convert the data into continuous form by calculating class boundaries. The following are the steps for determining class boundaries of data presented in such descending order. The first step, subtract the first class lower class limit from the second class upper class limit. That's 95 minus 94, which is equal to 1. Step 2, divide the difference by 2. 1 divided by 2 is equal to 0.5 Step 3 Subtract the value from all lower class limits and add to all upper class limits that is subtract 0.5 from all lower class limits and add 0.5 to all upper class limits Thus 95 minus 0.5 is 94.5 90 minus 0.5 is 89.5 85 minus 0.5 is 84.5 if you follow similar pattern, we will find 79.5, 74.5, 69.5. Next, add 0.5 to upper class limits. That's 99 plus 0.5 is 99.5. 94 plus 0.5 is 94.5. 89 plus 0.5 is 89.5. So following similar pattern, we will find 84.5, 79.5, 74.5. Finally, let's identify the true statement. Choice A, 85.5 up to 90.5 is one of the class boundaries. We don't have such class boundary, so choice A is not correct. Choice B, 82 is the class midpoint of the fourth class. Class midpoint is simply the average of class boundaries. Thus, class midpoint is equal to upper class boundaries of the fourth class plus lower class boundary of the fourth class divided by 2, which is equal to Upper class boundary of fourth class is 84.5 plus lower class boundary is 79.5 divided by 2. 84.5 plus 79.5 is equal to 164 divided by 2, which is equal to 82. Choice B is correct. Choice C, the class interval is 4. Class interval is simply the difference of the class boundaries. That's upper class boundary minus lower class boundary, which is equal to 5 in all classes. Thus, choice C is not true. Choice D, 95.5 is the upper class of the second class. The upper class of the second class is 94. So choice D is not true. The correct answer is choice B. Question number 54. Which of the following is correct about f of x is equal to cotangent x? It's important to draw the graph of a function for as of replying such questions. Thus, f of x is equal to cotangent x, which is equal to cosine x divided by sine x. Sin x is at the denominator, hence sin x shouldn't be equal to 0 or cotangent function is asymptote to vertical lines drawn through those points that make sin x 0. These points are 0, plus or minus pi, plus or minus 2 pi, etc. Cosine x is at the numerator, thus the graph crosses the x-axis at those points where cos x is equal to 0. These points are negative plus or minus pi over 2 plus or minus 3 pi over 2, plus or minus 5 pi over 2, etc. Hence, the graph looks like this. Thus, let's check which choice is correct. Choice A, its domain is x element of ordinal number, such that x different from n over 2 pi, where n elements of real number. n over 2 pi is the point where the graph crosses the x-axis, or the x-intercept. Thus, n over 2 pi is part of the domain. So choice A is not correct. Choice B, its period is 2 pi. The graph repeats in itself at the interval from negative pi to 0, 0 to pi. Thus, the period is pi, not 2 pi. 
choice C, its range is negative infinity comma 1, union 1 comma infinity. The graph stretch upward and downward indefinitely. Thus, all values of y are part of the range. So the range is all number. Choice C is not true. Choice D, its domain is x elements of all numbers such that x different from n pi, where n element of integer. The graph is asymptote to all values of n pi. Thus, n pi is not an element of the domain. So choice D is correct. Therefore, the correct answer is choice D. Question number 55. If P and Q are propositions, then which of the following compound propositions are equivalent? Let's draw the truth value table for P, Q, negation of P, negation of Q, and all the compound propositions in each choice. First, let's determine the possible truth values of P and Q. P can be true and Q can be true. P can be true and Q can be false. P can be false and Q can be true. P can be false and Q can be false. Next, let's determine negation of P, that's the negation of the first column. Negation of true is false. Negation of true is again false. Negation of false is true. Negation of false is true. Negation of Q, that's the negation of the second column. Negation of true is false. Negation of false is true. Negation of true is false. Negation of false is true. So let's determine the compound propositions in choice A. P by implication Q, meaning first column by implication second column. By implication is true only when both values are the same. Thus, true, and true by implication true is true. True by implication false is false. False by implication true is false. False by implication false is true. Negation of P by implication negation of Q. That's the third column by implication the fourth column. False by implication false is true. False by implication true is false. True by implication false is false. True by implication true is true. So, P by implication Q and negation of P by implication negation of Q are equivalent because their truth values are the same. Choice B, negation of P implies Q and Q implies negation of P. Negation of P implies Q is the third column and implies the second column. And implication is false only when the first value is true and the second value is false. Thus, false implies true is true. False implies false is true, true implies true is true, true implies false is false. And P implies negation of Q, that is second column implies the third column. True implies false is false, false implies false is true, true implies true is true, false implies true is true. These propositions are not equivalent because their values differ at row 1 and row 4. Choice C. Negation of P implies negation of Q and negation of Q and P. Negation of P implies negation of Q means the third column implies the fourth column. False implies false is true. False implies true is true. True implies false is false. True implies true is true. Negation of Q and negation of Q and P, that's the fourth column and the first column. Conjunction is true only when both values are true. Thus, False and true is false. True and true is true. False and false is false. True and false is false. These propositions are not equivalent because their values differ in row 1 and row 4. Choice D, negation of P and Q and negation of Q or P. Negation of P and Q means the negation of the first and the second column. That's true and true is true. Negation of true is false. True and false is false, the negation of false is true. True and false is false, the negation of false is true. False and false is false, the negation of false is true. Negation of Q or P, that's the false column or the first column. False or true is true. False or true is again true. False or false is false. True or true, true or false is true. This compound propositions, that's negation of P and Q and negation of Q or P are not equivalent because their values differ at row 1 and row 3. Therefore, the correct answer is choice A. Question number 56. The second derivative of a function f of x is equal to x times e is the power of negation of x is equal to blank. The product rule of derivation states that if f of x is equal to g of x times h of x, then 
f derivative of x is equal to the derivative of g of x times h of x plus g of x times the derivative of h of x. In this case, let g of x is equal to x and h of x is equal to e to the power of negative x. Then f derivative of x is equal to the derivative of x is 1 times e to the power of negative x plus x times the derivative of e to the power of negative x is e to the power of x negative x times the derivative of negative x at the, po the exponent, which is equal to 1 times e to the power of negative x is e to the power of negative x. The derivative of negative x is negative 1. Negative times positive is negative, thus minus x to the power of e to the power of negative x. The second derivative of x is equal to e to the power of negative x is e to the power of negative x times the derivative of negative x, that's negative 1, minus the derivative of x times e to the power of negative x is already determined as e to the power of negative x minus x times e to the power of negative x, which is equal to e to the power of negative x times negative 1 is negative e to the power of negative x minus e to the power of negative x. Negative times negative is plus x times e to the power of negative x, which is equal to negative e to the power of negative x minus e to the power of negative x is negative 2 e to the power of negative x plus x times e to the power of negative x. e to the power of negative x is common factor for both expressions, thus taking out e to the power of negative x as a common factor, e to the power of negative x times x e to the power of negative x divided by e to the power of negative x is simply x minus 2 e to the power of negative x divided by e to the power of negative x is 2. Thus, the correct answer is choice D. Question number 57. The table shown below is a simple frequency distribution of data with variable x. 1 with a frequency 2. 3 with a frequency 5, 4 with a frequency 6, 5 with a frequency 5, and 7 with a frequency 2. What is the variance of the data? Steps to solve this problem. First step, calculate the product of variable with a corresponding frequency. 1 times 2 is 2, 3 times 5 is 15, 4 times 6 is 24, 5 times 5 is 25, 7 times 2 is 14. Step 2. Determine the total sum of frequency as well as frequency times the variable. That's calculate the total sum of each of second row and third row. The total sum of second row is 2 plus 5 plus 6 plus 5 plus 2, which is equal to 20. The total sum of third row is 2 plus 15 plus 24 plus 25 plus 14, which is equal to 80. Step 3. Determine the mean by using the formula summation of Individual value times frequency divided by the summation of frequency, which is equal to summation of individual ti value times frequency is 80, divided by the summation of frequency is 20, 80 divided by 20 is 4. Then, let's write the mean in this fourth row like this. Step 4. Calculate the square of the difference between the mean and individual values. That's calculate the square of the difference between first and fourth rows y minus 4 is negative 3, negative 3 squared is 9, 3 minus 4 is 1, 1 squared is 1, 4 minus 4 is 0, 0 squared is 0, 5 minus 4 is 1, 1 squared is 1, 7 minus 4 is 3, 3 squared is 9. Step 5, multiply the frequency by the square of the difference between individual values and the mean. That's multiply fifth row by the second row. 2 times 9 is 18, 5 times 1 is 5, 6 times 0 is 0, 5 times 1 is 5, 2 times 9 is 18. Step 6, calculate the sum of frequency times the square of the difference between individual values and the mean. That is, the sum of the values in row 6. 18 plus 5 plus 0 plus 5 plus 18, which is equal to 46. At last, calculate the variance by using the formula. Variance square is equal to Summation of frequency times the difference of individual value minus the mean square divided by summation of frequency. Summation of frequency times individual value minus mean square is already calculated as 46 divided by the summation of frequency is 20. 46 divided by 20 is 2.3. Hence, choice B is the correct answer. Question number 58. Suppose the measurement of height in meter of 12 students is 1.72, 1.65, 1.7, 1.56, 1.72, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 
1.62, which one of the following is true about the mode of the data? The choices are about the mode of the data. Thus, let's tabulate the data for ease of identifying the modal class. Thus, the table looks like this. Height in meter and frequency. The shortest height is 1.5 fix. It appears only once. The next height is 1.65. It appears 1, 2, 3, 4 times. The next height is 1.70. It appears 1, 2, 3, 4 times. And the tallest height is 1.72. It appears 1, 2, and 3 times. Hence, we have two heights, that is 1.65 and 1.7, with the highest frequency. Hence, the modal class or the class with highest frequency are 1.65 and 1.70, and the data is bimodal one. Therefore, the correct answer is choice A. Question number 59. f of x is equal to 3 minus 2x. What is the inverse of f? Follow these steps to find the inverse of f. First, substitute f of x by y. That's y is equal to 3 minus 2x. Step 2, switch x and y. That is, write x in place of y and y in place of x. Meaning, x is equal to 3 minus 2y. Third, write y in terms of x. Taking positive 3 to the left of the equality sign, we will find x minus 3 is equal to negative 2y. Dividing both sides by negative 2. Negative 2y divided by negative 2 is y is equal to x minus 3 divided by negative 2 is negative 1 over 2 times x minus 3, which is equal to negative 1 over 2 times x is negative 1 over 2x or negative x over 2. Negative 1 over 2 times negative 3 is positive 3 over 2. For the step, back substitute y by f inverse of x. f inverse of x is equal to minus 1 over 2x plus 3. Thus, choice A is the correct answer. Question number 60. For what value of c, the conclusion of Rolex theorem is satisfied for the function f of x is equal to 2x minus x squared minus x u on the interval negative 2, 1. Three conditions to be fulfilled for working on Rolex theorem. The first condition, f of x must be continuous on the close bounded interval negative 2, 1. The second condition, f of x must be differentiable on open bounded interval negative 2, 1. f of x is a polynomial function which is continuous on closed bounded interval negative 2, 1, and differentiable on open bounded interval negative 2, 1. So, condition 1 and condition 2 are fulfilled. Condition 3, f of negative 2 must be equal to f of 1. f of negative 2 is 2 times negative 2 minus negative 2 square minus negative 2 cube, which is equal to f of 1 is 2 times 1 minus 1 square minus 1 cube, which is equal to so times negative 2 is negative 4 minus negative 2 square is 4 minus negative 2 cube is negative 8 which is equal to so times 1 is 2 minus 1 square is 1 minus 1 square is 1 which is equal to negative 4 minus 4 is negative 8 plus minus negative 18 is plus 8 which is equal to 2 minus 1 minus 1 is minus 2 Negative 8 plus 8 is 0, which is equal to 2 minus 2 is 0. So the third requirement is also fulfilled. If all the three conditions are fulfilled, then there is some number c such that f derivative of c is equal to 0. Let's calculate f derivative of x. f derivative of x is equal to the derivative of 2x is 2 minus the derivative of x squared is 2x minus the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So let's find f derivative of c is equal to 0. This implies 2 minus 2c minus 3c squared is equal to 0. To solve for c, use this formula. That's minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, which is equal to minus b is the coefficient of c, that's neg negative 2, plus or minus the square root of b squared means negative 2 squared minus 4 times a is the coefficient of c square that's negative 3 times the constant 2 divided by 2 times negative 3 which is equal to 2 plus or minus negative 2 square is 4 minus negative means plus 4 times 3 times 2 is 24 
divide by 2 times negative 3, which is equal to 4 plus 24 is 28. That is square root of 4 times 7. Square root of 4 is simply 2 times the square root of 7, which is equal to 2 cross out in all expressions that we left with negative at the denominator can be bring to the numerator negative 1 plus or minus root 7 divided by 3. Thus, choice B is the correct answer. Question number 61. Which of the following is true about a limit of a function? The limit of a function f of x describes the behavior of a function close to a particular x value. It doesn't necessarily give the value of a function at x. Mathematically, limit of a function f of x can be expressed as limit of f of x as x approaches to c is equal to l, which means that as x approaches to c, the function f of x or the value of y approaches to real number l. Therefore, choice A is the correct answer. Question number 62. Which of the following is equal to limit sin n over n square as n approaches to infinity? Limit sin n over n square as n approaches to infinity can be written as limit sin n over n times 1 over n as n approaches to infinity, which is equal to limit sin n over n as n approaches to infinity times limit 1 over n as n approaches to infinity, which is equal to limit sin n over n as n approaches to infinity times limit of 1 over n as n approaches to infinity is 0. So sin 1 over n times 0 is 0. Choice B is the correct answer. Question number 63. If a function f and g are continuous at x is equal to c, then which one of the following combinations is continuous at x is equal to c? If a function f is continuous at x is equal to c, then f square is continuous at x is equal to c. The other expressions may or may not be continuous. The right alternative is choice B. Question number 64. Limit of 1 plus 5 over x, the whole power of x, as x approaches to infinity is equal to. It's known that limit 1 plus 1 over x, the whole power of x, as x approaches to infinity is equal to e. Thus, let me introduce you one general formula. If limit 1 plus 1 over x, the whole power of x, as x approaches to infinity is equal to e, then limit 1 plus the constant c divided by x, the whole power of x, as x approaches to infinity is equal to e is the power of that constant, that c. To prove this formula, let c over x is equal to 1 over y. Multiplying risk cross, we will find 1 times x is x is equal to c times y is cy. So, as x approaches to infinity, y approaches to infinity, thus limit 1 plus c over x, the whole power of x, as x approaches to infinity is equal to limit 1 plus. We substitute c, the, c over x by 1 over y, the whole power of x means cy, as y approaches to infinity, which is equal to. This expression can be written as limit 1 plus 1 over y, the whole power of y, the whole power of c, as y approaches to infinity. The limit of the expression inside the bracket is already defined as e, the power of c. Therefore, limit of 1 plus 5 over x, the whole power of x, as x approaches to infinity is equal to e the power of 5. Thus, choice D is the correct answer. Question number 65. A geometric series with first term A and common ratio R is convergent if a geometric series is represented by the formula summation of A times R is the power of N, N ranging from 0 to infinity. A geometric series is convergent only when absolute value of R is less than 1 or negative 1 less than R, less than 1. That is, R has to be in between negative 1 and 1. So none of the choices can be the answer. That's all for this lesson. Stay safe.